Hello, and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Sydney Wydell, and I am from a I'm originally from Shorewood, Wisconsin, which is just a tiny bit north of Milwaukee, and I'm a senior studying geography and geoscience in the UW-Madison College of Letters and Science. And over the past few years, I've had the amazing opportunity to work in Professor Jack Williams' paleoecology lab in the geography department, and it's my huge joy to welcome him um, to this Badger talk today. Jack Williams is a professor in the geography department at UW-Madison, and he is also the former director of the Center for Climactic Research. And um, today he'll be talking about climate change and lessons we can learn based on how species have adapted and responded to changes in the past. Jack's research focuses on the response of plant species and communities um, to past and future climate change. And some of his research interests include novel climates and novel ecosystems. So communities of species that we've never seen before existing together for the first time. Um, and he looks at communities and climates from the last glaciation as a model system for understanding how climate is changing today. Um, some of Jack's recognitions include the Cooper Award for e from the Ecological Society of America, the Phil Stern Distinguished Faculty Award and a Rooms Fellowship from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Aldo Leopold Leadership Fellowship from the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, and the Fellowship from the Durham University's Institute for Advanced Study. Please welcome Jack Williams. Great, thank you so much, Cindy. It's really an honor to be introduced by you as well. It's been such a pleasure working with you over the years. All right, so today what I'm going to talk about is this topic of species response to climate change and how we can use the recent record, the last 15,000, 20,000 years or so, which is recent to a geologist, to understand how climate, how species can adapt to changing climates. Obviously a very important topic for today. All right, so this is sort of a talk in three parts. Uh, First part is to kind of establish, you know, often we, we, we've seen about a degree Celsius warming over the last century. We might have several more degrees Celsius warming, depending on how much we increase carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. So sometimes the first order question is, is a few degrees warming a big deal? It seems like a small number. We often have day-to-day, season-to-season variations that are much larger than that. So the first part of the talk, I want to sort of explain to you why it is that scientists think that a few degrees warming over several years, decades, or centuries can be a very big deal in terms of ecosystems and species responses. Then part two, I want to talk a bit about what we've seen from the past and how did species respond to the climate changes that came with the end of the last ice age, where we had a mile high ice sheet over here in Wisconsin, and now we have the forests and farmlands around us today. And then part three is, what do we do about that? How can we better understand the world around us? How can we take action to mitigate the worst case effects that go with some of the higher end climate change scenarios? So to kind of give away one of the punchlines of this first part of the talk, is climate change a big deal? And the answer is yes. And you know, 10 years ago, I might've had to make much more of a convincing argument around that. But nowadays in the news, we see this around us all the time, right? We see fires out West, you know, in Oregon and California, we see, drought effects affecting the Great Plains and, and other regions. Here in our own backyard, we've had pretty big you know, rain events, 15 inch rain events over 24 hour periods in the Madison and Driftless area. We've had flooding. If you, if you live close to Lake Michigan, you know there's been high lake levels and high rates of erosion. If you're from the Southeastern US, the big hurricanes, and all these could be tied to rising temperatures worldwide, intensification of the hydrological cycle and bigger floods, bigger droughts, more energy in the earth system basically. And so nowadays we're really seeing the impacts of climate change around us. But to kind of set the stage and start to kind of introduce the idea that we can look to the past and, and look at what how climate changes have a past, past ecosystems and landscapes, which is not all that long ago. Let's go back to that first slide of here's Madison today, beautiful Lake Mendota and the terrace, one of my favorite places in the world to have a, have a beer and hang out with colleagues on a nice kind of like you know, evening afternoon. Here is an approximation of what Madison might have looked like 19,000 years ago. We have this ice sheet over the northern half of Wisconsin, stretching all the way to Canada. Half of North America is under a several kilometer thick sheet of ice. And right here in Madison, we're at the glacial terminus, the end of that ice sheet. This is obviously not a photo of that ice sheet over Madison. This is from a glacier in Iceland, but it's kind of an analog of what we might have expected, minus the mountains, Wisconsin to look like 
20,000 years ago. And you can see that little insect map there and that little dashed line there, that little red line in the insect map is both the former edge of the Laurentide ice sheet and is also the Ice Age Trail, a great place for hiking and, and, and walking Wisconsin's landscapes. But one of the key takeaways here is that, that that mile high, several mile high ice sheet sitting over North America was triggered by a global cooling of about six degrees Celsius or about 11 Fahrenheit colder than present. So not that big a number puts a multiple kilometer mile high ice sheet over half of North America. Here's North America 14,000 years ago. We have now extinct animals like mammoths and camels and giant ground sloths and other animals living in Wisconsin landscapes. Farmers regularly, you know, when they're, when they're trenching their fields, they'll pull bones out. And we have some great examples of mastodons in our own geology mu museum here in Madison. This is also the time when uh, the first humans arriving in the Americas 14 to 15,000 years ago, you can kind of see this kind of boggy landscape. And at this point we have this kind of boreal tundra open kind of ecosystem like you might find in northern Canada today and these are the landscapes in southern Wisconsin with the world only cooler by maybe a degree and a half or maybe Celsius or maybe three degrees Fahrenheit. Now to really zoom out now we just kind of and that everything I just showed you was maybe 20 to 15,000 years ago but now what I'm going to do is we're going to go kind of full sweep of geological time. And this is a figure that's got a lot of information in it, but it's also a really important one. So let's kind of walk through it. The vertical axis is changes in temperature. So, um, and it's all relative today. So positive values would mean past times that were warmer than present. Negative values mean past times that were colder than present. So we can see kind of global temperature here. And then the time axis goes from, uh, let's see, I lost my mouse there. It goes from lower left at 60 million years ago before present. And it go through, you can go through 60, 40, 20 million years ago. We then go through a scale change. We go to 5 million years ago, 1 million years ago. We go through another scale change where we go through hundreds of thousands of years ago. We're kind of doing like an accordion of the, of the geological time scale. Since it's, we, have, we have to go through so much time, we kind of zoom from longer time scales to shorter time scales as we get up to present. So when you look at this, what you see is that 60 million years ago, which basically is the, when dinosaurs went extinct, the world was warmer by about 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. And that the big story over the last 60 million years has been a long-term cooling of your system from a greenhouse state of the climate system to the, what we sometimes call the ice house state. Then over the last several hundred thousand years, we had these regular glacial interglacial cycles, these ice ages, these interglacials, these cold and warm periods going back and forth um, over and over again. If you notice that um, blue bar up there, that's how long we as humans, Homo sapiens, have been around as a species on this planet. So we have been around for the last 100 to 200,000 years. And so our own history of what we've experienced as the climate change has been during these glacial and interglacial cycles, these past cold and warm periods. Um, so here we are, and here's these glacial and interglacial cycles. Now, the time period that I do the most work in is the last 20,000 years, kind of shown by that red bar there, where we go from the last ice age, uh, we had about five degrees colder than the present, and then we have this warming, we come out of the last ice age, and then we hit a period of relatively stable temperatures over the last 10,000 years. And if we think about where we are today, where we might go over this coming century and centuries as we add more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere and warm the world, you can see that we start to rewind the climate clock by millions of years. You have to go deeper and deeper into geological history to find climates kind of like we are experiencing or may experience over the coming decades. And we are moving to climates that are outside our human experience, out of our, out of our societal experience, because remember all of our agriculture, all of our food systems developed over here during the last five to 8,000 years. Um, but we are going increasingly to deeper time geological analogs for the climates of the future. So if we focus then on this sort of last 10, 20 to 10,000 years, it's kind of a key time period to really understand as a model system for what might have some analogs to what's happening today, some big things. First, global temperatures rise by about five degrees Celsius, maybe 10 degrees Fahrenheit, give or take. Ice sheets collapse. We have large ice sheets across the Northern Hemisphere. I mentioned those ice sheets over Madison. Now we see sort of the Northern Hemisphere perspective of ice sheets across North America, across Eurasia. 
and contrast that with today at right there, the recent past in which we have just ice over Greenland and you know melting ice now over the Arctic Ocean and so forth. All that water that used to be in those ice sheets went into the world oceans as that ice melted. So at the same time as all that ice melts away, sea level rises by about 120 meters or about 400 feet. That's a lot of sea level rise. And not coincidentally, at the same time, the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere go up from about 190 parts per million in the atmosphere to about 280 parts per million in the atmosphere. And we think that's a major, one of the big, big reasons for the temperature rise we see coming out of the last ice age. So just thinking about that sea level part alone, you know, here's, a, here's a nice view of what the world would have looked like 20,000 years ago. You can see those ice sheets again in the white areas. Then notice the light brown versus dark brown. Light brown in areas that are land today Dark brown are areas that were land 20,000 years ago that got flooded when all that ice melted and all that water went in the world ocean. So notice how 20,000 years ago, Alaska is part of Asia. There's a Bering land bridge and all these animals and humans moving back and forth across this natural land bridge. Eurasia is, all, is connected to Indonesia. There's, there that, all the islands in the Southeast um, Indonesia are part of the Asian landmass. New Guinea and Australia are one continent. So you can just see a radically different world just due to sea level effects alone. Um, one interesting, this is kind of a little bit of a side point, but it's kind of a cool side point. One of the things that scientists and geophysicists have started to realize is that not only when ice sheets, ice sheets have two effects on sea level. One is that when they melt, all that water goes into oceans and world sea level rises. The other very interesting effect is they also have a gravity effect. And so there's this interesting fact that when ice sheets, when ice sheets exist, they actually have a gravitational pull on the water around them and they pull the water to them. That actually creates a local rise in sea level whenever you have a large ice sheet. And when those ice sheets melt, that gravity force goes away and the water relaxes away from the continent. So one of the interesting implications today, for example, is that if say Greenland melts, world sea level goes up, but sea level around Greenland drops because of that, that gravity effect. So there's some really interesting interplays here that people are really starting to appreciate some of these more complicated nuances. But globally, sea level goes up when the ice sheets melt. All right, now going back to this kind of last critical time period, and now we look at this plot 20,000 years ago to today, we often count backwards. We talk about age, so we're going from 22,000 years ago to today. This is another temperature plot where zero is the same as today, warmer, colder, positive and negative. And this is a temperature record from Greenland. So Greenland was about 10 degrees colder than present at the last ice age. But then notice that it doesn't just kind of gra gradually and, and, and smoothly get warmer coming out of last ice age. It's very abrupt. There's some very big reversals and rapid temperature changes. So this is another important piece of information from the past, that the climate system can change abruptly. It doesn't change smoothly and gradually. It can change quite quickly sometimes. And there's a lot of interest in understanding what causes the climate system to change so quickly. There's a lot of work by my colleagues who are paleoclimatologists understanding what causes the climate system to change abruptly sometimes. And if you look at those numbers down, down below there, you can see those are big numbers, like 10 degrees warming in a few years. These are rapid even by human lifetime standards. These are truly abrupt changes. As an ecologist, what I'm more interested in is how do species adapt to and accommodate these kinds of abrupt changes. Okay, so that's just kind of a, an overview of picture of some of the key features of the past and how it's changed from the last ice, today, last ice age to today and as a kind of model system with some interesting parallels for what might happen around us going forward. So how do species accommodate and adapt to those past climate changes? Well, a quick aside into methods, a lot of the work that my lab does, the kind of work that Sydney does um, is, is working with lake sediments. We go out and we collect cores. You can see in lower right there, that photo is from, from a team um, working at a site down in Illinois, uh, we have just, we're on a floating platform consisting of two canoes and a plywood board. There's five of us on the platform. It's very not COVID, you know, quarantine safe. We have to, we have to take a, a hiatus from field work right now, but working in close proximity, we can, we can get our mud a meter at a time. And a rule of thumb around here is that the lakes are accumulating mud at the bottom of these lakes about a meter every thousand years. So if you've ever fished Lake Mendota or the other lakes around here, and these lakes have been around for about 14,000 years, there's about 14,000 meters of mud below you, or about 40 feet of mud, representing 14 to 15,000 years of accumulated history. 
So all these things wind up in these lakes. Pollen blows into these lakes. And so we can tell what kind of plants used to live around these lakes. We can get radiocarbon dates to figure out how old the, the, the sediments are. We can find charcoal to tell us when there are past fires in the area. There's all kinds of geochemical indicators of past temperature and water balance and evaporation rates. One of the cool new things is ancient DNA and getting ancient DNA out of the mud sediments. There's all kinds of stuff that people do with these lake sediments. It's really a fun and a remarkable field. So one example, again, from almost our backyard is beautiful Devil's Lake, Wisconsin, where there have been several coring campaigns. And this is the most recent one from the 2015 paper. And you can see, if you, you know, one thing to get used to is that geologists often think of time as vertical because we have the oldest sediments at the bottom and sediments build up over time. So this is a record from Devil's Lake that goes from 14,000 years ago at the bottom to today at the top. And then those various uh, color diagrams there are the relative abundances of different tree taxa based upon the pollen found in those sediments of those different ages. So you can see that 14,000 years ago, right after this area deglaciated, there are spruce forests around Devil's Lake, like you might find in Canada today. Then as temperatures rose, those spruce died out. Pine became a major uh, abundant component of the landscape. A few thousand years later, oak joins and elm. We see aspen and birch coming and going. So we start to see these large scale forest transformations, multiple ecosystem trans trans transformations, largely driven by rising temperatures between about 14 to 10,000 years ago and different species tracking these rising temperatures. Some doing better under the rising temperatures, some doing worse. We can also look at the fire history. That's a whole other talk for another day, but just kind of making the point that at this one site, we have a pretty detailed knowledge about the kind of ecosystems around these sites and how that's changed over time. So let's see if this animation works. So what I'm gonna show you now is going from one site at Devil's Lake to many sites. And our field has been doing this work for decades now. So we can, we can collect many individual records at many individual sites and start to make conical scale maps showing the changing abundances of species over time. Uh, you can see in upper right there, this is work done by Anna George, who's one of my master's now PhD students, who's made these really beautiful animations. And what we're gonna do as I start the animation in a moment here, if all goes well, we're gonna look at four taxa. Picea in the dark green is spruce, red poesy is grass, oak is Quercus, and hemlock is suga. And what you're gonna see in the blue, all that blue is the, is the ice sheets about to melt. We're gonna, watch, we're gonna watch an animation going forward kind of a, a few hundred years to a thousand years at a time. And what you're gonna watch is the ice sheets melt away and you're gonna watch these attacks, uh, these species expand northwards, migrating northwards as climate change. So here we go, the animation started. You can see it, it's a little hard to see maybe, but upper left there's a, a time counter, 16,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago going forward. You can see the ice retreating, you see all that spruce filling in the upper Midwest, the expansion of these forests, but now spruce is dying out and oak is becoming abundant. Spruce is moving into Western Canada. You can start to see the Great Plains develop and these sort of grasslands of the Great Plains. Now you can see oak is well established across the Eastern North America. You can see hemlock forest establishing, dying out, or not sorry, dying out, that was the end of the animation and so forth. So a quick animation, but just, and I'll, I'll let it play through one more time as I talk over it a little bit more, but just so you can really see how each of those dots represents one site that one team went on and collected and how we can gather many of these sites together and start to really understand that when climate change, species move. A primary way that species adapt to changing climates is changing their distributions. They might die out in some places where the climates are no longer favorable for them. Maybe a heat wave, maybe a drought, maybe a fire knocks them out, but then they can also establish into new areas and start to colonize new terrain. And so one of the key challenges for ecological management in this era of changing climates is helping species move, helping species ecosystems transform as the world changes around us. One other key point we learned from the past is that species don't move in lockstep. It's not like you have some tightly knit group of species that all kind of march together. That can happen sometimes, but more often what we see is a sort of what we call individualistic responses that you look at that top map, that's, a, that's showing spruce for four different time periods. Spruce has a fairly, fairly simple story of expanding northwards. As the ice melts, it expands northwards, its southern populations die out. That's what we call a leading edge and a trailing edge of expansion at the leading edge and dying out at the trailing edge. Well, whereas Fraxinus ash 
it doesn't move as much, but it goes from being not very abundant to being really abundant to being not very abundant again. And so each tax is following a little bit different history. And as that happens, we see species, we see communities, ecosystems come and go. 15 to 13,000 years ago, we would have talked about the majestic spruce ash forests of Wisconsin. Those spruce ash forests don't exist today because they each follow their own path. And today, spruce is the north, ash is in the eastern US, and they're no longer tightly uh, associated the way they were in uh, earlier time periods. Another key lesson we get from the past is the idea that, you know, one question is how quickly can forests respond? You know, it, it takes a few decades for a tree to grow up. It takes time for seeds to disperse off to new locations. So a key question that faces modern ecologists and forest managers is the rate of forest responses. Will forests convert and die off quickly as climates change? Will they persist for many years? How quickly can can forests change in response to changing climates. We have another high resolution record here. This is one from, from Switzerland in which that left plot is a record of temperature. It's, it's through a proxy called oxygen isotopes, but think of it as temperature. And you can see that there's a moment there about 14,000 years ago, 14,600 years ago, which is a rapid step change and temperatures warm quite quickly at this site. Well, notice that right when that step change happens in temperature, right about here, almost immediately, Sage crashes, sedge crashes, junipers take off. So very quickly, you have an ecosystem conversion from a tundra type ecosystem to more of a juniper um, woodland in a space of a few decades, almost immediately after changing climates. On the other hand, notice it takes a while for birch to become abundant and for pine to become abundant. So we interpret this as delayed migration, that it takes sometimes centuries for trees to move into an area by throwing out a few seeds, establishing new populations, they throw out new seeds. So it can take, it can take centuries for, for trees to migrate across a landscape. So we have these slow migration rates for some of these larger tree taxa. A piece of good news that comes from the past is that we don't see many species extinctions. All the species around us today have lived through multiple glacial and interglacial cycles and past climate changes. So we have some reason to think that species have some adaptive capacity to handle changing climates. One good example where we do have a species extinction is Picea critchfeldii. This is a extinct species of spruce. And we're looking here at the, the cross sections of living of needles from living spruce species, white spruce, black spruce, red spruce. And then these are cross sections from fossils we found down at these southeastern sites that don't have any mass today. So we think these are actually from an extinct species of spruce that live down in Missouri and, and Tennessee, no longer with us today. So it happens, but maybe not a lot. But of course, the, the last ice age is famous for um, big extinctions of big animals, that we had this worldwide population of saber-toothed tigers and woolly mammoths and giant short-faced bears, and you can see them in museums across Wisconsin. And worldwide, we lose about two-thirds, almost 100 out of 150 large vertebrate genera, um, you know, remember species, genus, genera, over the last 45,000 years. And so we have a worldwide extinction of big animals um, that hit all the major continents over the last 45,000 years. One of the in really interesting features that it's very much the big animals that go extinct. You can see a bunch of histograms down there and the histograms are for e different continents, South America, North America, Australia, uh, Eurasia. And um, the, 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 the horizontal axis there is, is the body mass and um, on a log scale. Uh, and the gray bars are the body masses of the animals that survived the last 45,000 years. And the red bars are the body masses of the animals that went extinct during the last 45,000 years. And so the big takeaway here is that it's the big animals that went extinct. All the reds are to the right side, the higher end of the body mass spectrum there. So the little animals, they're fine. They don't go extinct. The big animals get hammered. And so this is one of the reasons why people often think that it's some combination of climate change and human hunting, human pressures that drive these big animals to extinction. It's probably not just climate change alone. It's probably this intersection of changing climates, changing habitats, and then the worldwide spread of humans around the world, which is happening at the same time, that drives many of these big animals to extinction. So if we care about species conservation today, one of the good news lessons is that climate change has not driven plants much to extinct in the past, has not driven small animals extinct much in the past, but big animals are very vulnerable to these kinds of climate change and human pressure combinations. 
Okay. So by the way, Fran, I'm looking like it looks like people are just seeing me and maybe not my slide deck anymore. I'm going to keep going with my, my slides right now. I'm just seeing myself on that view. Thanks. Great. Okay. So to summarize, what have we learned from the past? Is a three to five degrees Celsius, you know, maybe up to 11 degree Fahrenheit change in temperature a big deal? Yes. We see this huge melting of ice sheets. We see this huge, you know, movement of species across continents with the end of the last ice age as an equivalent kind of change in the past. And what do we see about how species adapt or fail to adapt to climate change? Well, some key lessons we learn is that when climates change, species move. Even rooted species, you know, a tree is not going to walk across a landscape, but it'll throw seeds out. The population moves as some populations die out and new, new populations are found into new areas. We can see this reshuffling of species into novel ecosystems. We can see that there's both these fast, within a few years and decades responses to slow, multi-century, very slow responses. And we can see that extinctions are rare for some groups of taxa, like plants and small, small animals, but then common, unfortunately, for other bigger animals. So there's a difference in vulnerability. So in the last you know, third of my talk or so, let's move then from what have we learned to what can we do? Well, you know, this is a, a challenge, right? As Matt, I don't know if, you know, and it was seen The Martian and Matt Damon, one of my all-time favorite, uh, you know, uh, science movies. You know, Matt Damon is stuck on a, on a you know, all by himself on, on the Martian planet. And he's like, well, I'm going to have to science this stuff out of this. And he's got to really come up with solutions here. And that's, as a scientist, that's one of the first things I always think about. As a scientist, how can we bring better discoveries, better knowledge to bear on solving societal problems? So one of the goals is to how can we bring all of our available data and knowledge to bear on building improved forecasts for the future. One of the kind of hot topics right now in ecology is called ecological forecasting. Just like you have weather forecasters who make predictions about the weather will be like over the coming days to weeks, ecological forecasters are trying to provide policymakers and citizens and, and uh, land managers with ecological forecasts about how a, a lake a stream, a forest will behave over the coming days, weeks, years, different time scales for different systems. But again, it's sort of building better predictive capacity for decision making. To do that, you use models that make predictive forecasts, and those models need to be tested against and constrained by data. And the part of the work that I do the part most on is the data providing. How do we gather these many observations of the past and the changes of the past, the changes around us today, to inform and better constrain and test these models? You can see that I've got that time scale of all the climate changes of the last 60 million years at that top left plot. You can see the bottom left maps of showing how we see these large ecological responses of the last 20,000 years. This is really important information to bring to bear for testing and developing and refining these ecological forecasting models for how they predict future ecological responses to future climates. And you know, I think one of the messages of exciting, you know, exciting work is that this is an era of big data right now, that there are so many ecologists around the world collecting so many different kinds of observations, that the challenge for us has always been how do we gather, organize, and gain insight from these many observations by many scientists from many parts of the world. And so one example, this is GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Every dot there represents some spot where some scientist has taken some observation of some set of species at that location. So we can start to get um, understandings of where species are found, what areas are more diverse or less diverse. We can start to understand how you know, climate or other factors uh, regulates the abundance and diversity of organisms on the world. Um, another area and example are the eddy flux towers that measure the exchange of carbon dioxide between the land surface and the atmosphere. So as we put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the plants are taking some of that back down from the atmosphere and you know, they're growing more leaves and growing more biomass. And so we have these networks of eddy flux towers that are measuring how the terrestrial biosphere is exchanging carbon dioxide with the atmosphere and how that's changing over time. We have a set of sites in Northern Wisconsin, Ankur Desai is a colleague in atmospheric and ocean sciences. And he's, you know, he's got a project Cheesehead working in Northern Wisconsin right now, looking at these exchanges of carbon dioxide with Northern Wisconsin forests and wetlands and the, and the atmosphere. There's all kinds of great citizen scientists. Anybody with a phone can go out and take photos of the species they see around them and they can upload to the iNaturalist and get identifications of, oh, that's this salamander or that flower or that insect. So iNaturalist is a great tool for citizen science and observing the world around you. Project Budburst to understand 
the timing of when seasons are changing and when plants are leafing out or birds are migrating and how that's tied to the changing environments around us. And then the piece that I bring to this context, my, my, my community brings this context, with a lot of us working on this, is gathering together these records of the past, a resource that we call the Neotoma Paleoecology Database. That's an open resource that anybody can use it. Anybody can put data in, anybody can pull data out. It's community curated by experts. So we have some standards of data curation and data quality and, and taxonomic name harmonization so that we have some, some quality and consistency to our records. And it's available for anybody to, to, to study these kinds of climate changes in the past. We now have, you know, we're, we're, we're actively growing. So a recent snapshot, over 7 million observations across 37,000 data sets and 18,000 sites. So it's something that's growing quite quickly. And we're really excited by this community effort to gather and mobilize these data. So, okay, that's the science side and that's great. There's lots of important stuff that can be done there, but as citizens, what can we do? And so one important lesson is that rates of change are really important, that species can adapt to climate change, and they have adapted to past climate change, but rate matters. If it's too fast, they can't keep up. So rate controls adaptation. So what we can do then, we have several options. We can slow down or ideally stabilize the rates of climate change and climate system. That's where things like the Paris Accord are important or other ways of limiting our, our greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel burning and you know, moving to uh, you know, clean, you know, renewable energy sources. That's important because that, buys, that slows down the rate of climate change and that buys more time for species to adapt. We could try to accelerate rates of ecological adaptation. We could help species migrate. We could help species of, evolve in response to changing climates. And we have you know, one important lesson is not to despair. There are actions that we can take to help uh, help this transition in this changing world around us. So a couple of quick, you know, things, if you, know, if you have like one resource that's a good place to uh, get started in learning about climate change and things that you can do as an individual, as a city, as a state, as a, as a country, Project Drawdown is great. I always recommend this as a go-to starting resource. Some of the important things that come from that is talking about climate change, having conversations about what can we do to uh, make things better, Meat is an important source of greenhouse gas emissions. So less food waste, less of a meat-based diet. Some people do meatless Mondays. That's a solution. Better, better energy efficiency. Don't waste heat. Insulate your house. That's a very cost-effective way that as a homeowner usually has a win-win of saving you money. Solar energy, renewable energy, uh, better mileage vehicles. And in this era, to be really clear, I'm not recommending any vote for any political party, but it's important to hold your elected leaders accountable and say that climate change is an important issue to you. So I am sort of, a, I would say, you know, advocating for an issue as opposed to a particular set of candidates. Um, and in this, that's on the, the slowing down climate change side of things. On the um, accelerating adaptation, one of the things that is, people are thinking a lot about these days is managed relocation or assisted migration, helping species move from places that are becoming less favorable to them as climate change or sea level rises and to places that are becoming newly favorable for them. This is really important, for example, for endangered species like this little New Zealand bird that has only, only a few patches of habitat that it lives in today, but there are other patches that might be suitable for it. So helping it relocate and colonize into new areas is, a, is an, a, an important adaptation strategy. Um, also, you know, this has been happening to some degree accidentally for some species. Magnolia is, is a beautiful tree. I have one in my backyard that is native to the southeastern U.S., but because it's an ornamental that maybe pe many people plant in their backyards, it's now escaped from those backyards into the forests of New England, well outside its historic range, but probably helping the species adapt to the warming climates and, and expanding into areas that would have probably taken centuries to get there on its own, but has been given sort of an accidental but helpful boost by people uh, uh, planting that species in their area. And then one of the areas that's, uh, you know, it's just at the kind of the, the ground floor, but I think it's gonna be increasingly important is this idea of assisted evolution, crossbreeding individuals like corals. Corals are getting hammered by climate change right now. We've had some really losses of coral bleaching, widespread losses. So can we find a subset of individuals that are most resilient to heat stress and heat shock and help them uh, evolve, you know, sort of seed the next generation 
of more heat resistance corals and or you know, transplanting corals. You can help corals migrate and relocate as well. And so again, in summary, this point about don't despair, we have this transforming world around us. It's disorienting and it's challenging, but we can take effective action. We know that species have survived many past climate changes. We have this ever expanding uh, breadth of knowledge thanks to research universities like UW-Madison around the country, around the world. And we see evidence of adaptation certainly happening in the past and happening today. And there's ways we can assist this process. So I'll just kind of close here by thanking you for your time and attention. And I also just want to thank um, Fran and the Badger Talks group for putting this, this, this series on. I think it's a wonderful idea. And the work I've shown you really represents decades of e effort by lots and lots of people. So I'm thanking here both people in my lab, um, thanking people involved with the Neotoma database. That's the source of all the maps I've shown you over, the last, over this talk. And there's really drawing upon a broader community of many paleoecologists working around the world to understand past climate and ecological dynamics and give us this knowledge for ma making a better future. So thanks all, and happy to take questions. And while we're waiting for questions, I'll just add a quick one more thanks, I forgot. Thanks to the National Science Foundation, thanks to the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation for their financial support of this work. That's hugely important too. Hi everyone. Fran Paleo Moyer here, Badger Talks producer. And Jack, thank you so much uh, for sharing that information with us. I'm assuming we probably have a mix of people with science backgrounds and people with non-science backgrounds on the talk today. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna encourage them to put some questions in the chat if you have additional questions. Um, I have to say as a non-science person though, Jack, I find your talk to be very um, calming and relieving. <laughs> you really do a great job of putting it all into perspective for us. So thanks so much for that today. Um, we do have a question here from Jerry Clark and he's asking, how do you see global food systems changing and adapting as we moved from hunter-gatherer to modern agriculture? Mm. Boy, that's a big question and that's, that's a good one. Um, I mean, yeah, you can look at the broad trajectory of moving from a uh, hunter-gatherer to more pastoral societies, to low intensity agriculture, to high intensity agriculture, to the modern food systems, right? Very mechanized, it's, you know, very industrialized. And, you know, I have shown you kind of what we've seen about sort of forests and grasslands, but there's a whole other community out there of archeologists that are also looking at the spread of agriculture at kind of local scales all the way to global scales. Some of the work I haven't talked about is trying to put these together, understanding how the growing human populations and the growing human footprint have affected these ecosystems. And we actually have some sort of active research right now, right now looking at that. So the quick summary is that we live in the Anthropocene and that we, have, we are transforming the world for these food systems. Um, and of course we have, this, we have our own kind of growing dependence upon climate stability and food security that goes with that. So that's a quick answer and I'm happy to maybe talk more if there's a follow-up question there. Great. And uh, hey, that range mapper was a really cool tool. That really, um, again, gave you a sense of, you know, the vast amount of time that you're looking at and the change there. So shout out to Anna George, your student. Um, I know that you spent some time working um, in studying mammoths. Can you like in a very brief snippet, just talk about your work there? Yeah, happy to. And before I dive into that, let me just also give a shout out. One of the great things that's being in the Department of Geography here at Madison is that we have a great group of cartographers, people who specialize in making these beautiful maps and thinking about how to make them accessible to people. So it's been a really fun project having scientists like myself team up with map makers and cartographers to make these kind of next generation really cool maps. So that's been super fun. Um, yeah, so on the mammoth side, we did a fun project a few years ago. We went to a little island in, northern, um, in the Northern Pacific that used to be part of that Bering Land Bridge. Remember that big dark brown area that connected Alaska and, and Asia? There's an island there that used to be part of the Bering Land Bridge that became isolated. It became an island when sea level rose and a small population of woolly mammoths got trapped out there on that island. But amazingly, that woolly mammoth population is the second oldest or second most recent surviving population of mammoths. Both mammoths went extinct at the end of the last ice age, about 10,000 years ago. That population lived until about 5,000 years ago. 
And so at the time of early agriculture in the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East, there's still mammoths living on this little island in the North Pacific, which is just amazing. And what we did was we established from our lake sediments and our ancient DNA work and our pollen work, we established a time of extinction of 5,600 years ago. It's a very precise time of extinction. And we have some hypotheses based upon our data that it was actually freshwater loss on that island that drove that, that population extinct. So we think that population was not killed off by humans as far as we know. We think it actually ran out of fresh water, which is kind of a sad end for that population. But it's also a story of resilience that a little island could support a breeding population of mammoths for many, many thousands of years on its own. So that was that part of that project. Very interesting. And with regard to fresh water supply and the implications of climate change for us, is that something that your group is studying as well or who, who's studying that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and it's, of course, you know, lots of people are studying it from lots of different angles. You have people who are water resource managers, manager, look at the Great Lakes or groundwater supply. Um, the part, the angle that we've taken looking at that is looking at past droughts and the degree to which we've had collapses of tree populations or forests due to past droughts. We think today of like, you know, drought and fire as happening in the Western US and then not so much in the Eastern US. But then we've had some big fires like the Gatlinburg fire and the, and the Smokies a couple of years ago, that was a big fire. So our records show that fires do happen in these Eastern, you know, not so dry forests and that every few centuries you can have a big drought too. And so we have an active project right now in kind of Northern Michigan, Southern, uh, sorry, Southern Michigan, Northern Indiana in which we are looking at the collapses of American beach. It's at, American beach has a beautiful white bark. It's a, it's a deciduous tree you find along the shores of Lake Michigan. We have evidence that beach populations crashed repeatedly um, over the last 10,000 years. And we think that's due to past droughts. And now we're collecting the data to test that hypothesis. So we look at droughts and forest collapses as our tie, tie into that water question that you asked about. Interesting, thank you. Yeah. We do question from Lydia Dean and she asks how were the tree species over those thousand year time periods determined from mud samples from lakes yeah great question I might try to is it just chat right now or can people see my slides at all let me let me go back to a slide real quickly to help answer that question it's a great it's an important question I kind of skimmed past that and I was giving my talk here all right so so here we have this kind of quick slide I showed in passing. If you look in the lower left there, there are a couple of photos there of pollen grains under um, a light microscope. And so what, you know, basically, you know, we have lots of trees growing around a lake. They're releasing lots of pollen in the air. So if you have seasonal allergies like I do, that's kind of bad news when grass starts to release all this pollen. And then some of that pollen just winds up in the lake. It falls down and settles through the water column and then gets built up and it gets added to that building column of mud at the bottom of the lake. So what we can do is that we can take a, you know, a small cubic centimeter of mud um, and then get the pollen out of it. And then under a microscope, we can actually count, we might count say 300 pollen grains and we can identify them based upon the shape of the pollen grain saying, oh, that's an oak pollen grain and that's a chestnut pollen grain and that's pine and that's grass. And you can see those, those photos there are examples of like pine pollen grain. Pine always looks kind of like a Mickey Mouse to me. It's got those kind of ears. We call them bladders, but it's kind of got that Mickey Mouse shape. Chestnut has kind of that elongate, kind of like a football shape. So we can do actual pollen identification and tell what kinds of plants lived in an area from a layer of mud that was dated to be from 10,000 years ago. So that's how we do that. Great, thanks so much, Jack. Well, I think that wraps up the questions for today. I just wanna thank you so much for joining us and talking about this important work and thanks for the work that you're doing um, on all of our behalf. <laughs> thank you, Fran, really glad to do it and glad to share this. Thanks for, for, thanks for your time and attention. Great, so everybody tune in next week, uh, Wednesday, November 4th at noon. So we'll be Wednesday next week instead of Tuesday. And Professor Steve Ackerman is going to be joining us, and he's going to be talking about the SS Edmund Fitzgerald, which was an American Great Lakes freighter, as you're probably familiar, that sank in Lake Superior in a storm in 1975, and the entire crew of 29 perished. And Steve will be talking about the disaster, one of the best known in Great Lakes shipping history, 
and how it related to the weather conditions at the time, as well as the song by Gordon Lightfoot, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, please check out the full schedule of upcoming Badger Talks at badgertalks.wisc.edu. You can also sign up for our email list there. Um, and as always, feel free to uh, email me at badgertalks at uwmad.wisc.edu for future suggestions of topics you'd like to see on Badger Talks Live. All right, thanks for tuning in everybody. Have a great day.